a faulty passive infrared detector light. This was sent by Philip, who also sent a box of Edel Tropfen Nutty Cluster Liqueur Chocolates, my absolute favourite, so super thanks for that. He said he got a load of these at the same time. They take uh, four triple A's, and the other ones are absolutely fine, but this one just eats its way through batteries. It really gets through them quite quickly. I'm a bit suspicious that I may know what that is. I've already tried batteries in it. It wasn't showing high quiescent current, so what I'm thinking of doing is unscrewing this, taking the covers off, and then let's see what happens if I pull this out. That is just a metal strip for putting onto magnetic things. But I'm going to take covers off here, and then I'm going to put it on soak test on the bench power supply. And that way I'll see if the current starts showing rogue values. But I do have suspicions as what this might be, but the only way to find out for sure is to take it a bit and find out. So I shall do that. So is this going to come off? That screw is quite long. Uh, this ain't really want to come out at that end. Is it going to come out? It is out. Interesting that they've used a spring. I'm going to see if I can just unclip this. They've used a spring at both ends to connect onto the power. That's interesting. It looks as though it's got a BISS0001 type chip in it. One moment, I'll just double check that. Oh, so totally wrong. It's that style of chip, but this one is a, a CSC0001, so it's a clone. Well, that's all right. Right, well, I'm going to put this in the bench power supply and I'm going to leave it just on for a while and we'll see what happens, see if I can make it start drawing too much current and then we'll sort of analyse what we can find. I think uh, I think Phillips had this open himself. I wonder if the B is for bad, but we'll find out. I shall put this on test and I'll be back shortly. Some pictures have been taken. It's time to explore the circuitry. The circuitry starts with this positive terminal at this end of the circuit board, and this is something I don't like. They've done the usual that they often do with Chinese designs, that they use the flooded uh, ground plane, the zero volt reference. So from the negative terminal at the other end, there's a large expanse of copper. And that copper is surrounding the positive pad with a fraction of a millimetre clearance, and also that pads overhang slightly, and if this spring gets pushed down, then the only thing between it and the copper is the layer of solder resist. I wish they didn't do that. I wish they'd stop that copper short of there. But as it happens, that's not the issue. The positive goes down to, it actually goes to all the diodes and the LEDs on the other side. But it also goes to this polarity protection diode, and then there's a couple of filtering capacitors here, a voltage regulator and then a fairly chunky capacitor on the output of that voltage regulator to provide a stable supply to the circuitry. That then continues from this end of this section of the circuit board. And all this circuitry around here is based around the passive infrared detector. There's quite a lot of discrete components because it is a very analogue device. It's got various time delays, it's got various filtering and feedback and things like that because this is putting out a very low level signal. When it wants to turn on the LEDs, it turns on this little A2SHB MOSFET transistor, just a miracle transistor. These things are amazing. You find them in so many uh, products because they're very easy to drive and they're capable of switching really high current. Things worthy of note about this design. The one part of the circuit board I didn't show is from here upwards on the end because it's just another five of these 150 ohm resistors, 151. One five and a multiplier of one, so that's uh, up just one zero, so that's 150 ohms. What they've done here, and it's unusual, they've got five LEDs down here, they've got five LEDs over here, and the light sensor, and they've basically got a resistor for every single one of the LEDs. That's nice, it's a good feature, and likewise, over here, they've got another five resistors for the LEDs. For the light sensor, they've got the sensor on the front, they've got a matching suitable resistor for that to control its uh, sensitivity. And I think they've also got a bit of extra circuitry down here with filtering before it goes into this sort of BS, uh, BIS0001 type clone chip. So um, the first thing I did was I looked for heat because even at just a few milliamps, and when I connected to the bench power supply, it was showing leakage of about five milliamps. And 
if you use a thermal imaging camera or even just a uh, thermocouple and touch onto some components, you can find what's actually active even at that low current. However, that was skewed because to be able to actually uh, see what I was doing, I had to have light on because if I turned the light off, this went into passive infrared detection mode and it would turn itself on. And that would do two things. The LEDs would heat up the circuit board, which skews the results of thermal imaging. And also, um, the other slight issue I had with that, I'm just feeling that spring, it feels loose, but it's not loose, it's just a very delicate spring. The other issue I had with that was the shiny soda connections. One of the things you quickly learn with thermal imaging is that if you've got a couple of hot lights, even though they're LED, they're putting out a bit of heat, they will cause reflections in soda connections and it gives loads of what looks like hot spots on the circuit board. What would have been ideal is having this out outdoors maybe, in daylight, I was doing it late at night, so it skewed the results, it didn't let me actually test that. So I had to make a guess instead and my guess was that it's going to be the thin film layer, multi-layer capacitor because they are really notorious for doing this. So what I did was, I heated it with a hot air gun and the leakage current went down slightly. So I decided, right, okay, I'm going to desolder that. And to desolder it, I simply just flooded it with solder and then just slid it off the circuit board. And then I tested the unit again and the leakage current had dropped to zero. So let me show what's happened with this capacitor. And keep in mind, a capacitor should not have any resistance at all. It should ideally be super high impedance. So if I put this either side, I shouldn't be getting anything, but instead I'm getting a resistance of about 1,000 ohms across that capacitor, and that's where the current was leaking. So what would make a capacitor like that go leaky? This is where I bring in the notepad. Uh, I'm not sure the value of that. I'm going to guess it's 10 microfarad. I tried testing the meter, but it's got a parasitic resistance across it of that 1K, which kind of skews the results. I tried testing it on a component tester, and the component tester thought it was two diodes in inverse parallel because of the weird reading it was giving because it was a faulty component. Let me bring in the notepad and explain what goes wrong with these capacitors. Let's start with one of the easiest surface mount components to make, a resistor. What they do with a resistor is they get a little block of ceramic material and they coat the surface of it with a sort of carbon material compound, an ink, or I'm not really sure what they use. I don't know if it's, it, it's basically it's carbon in a binder, but the thickness of that and the conductivity of it will determine the resistance. And they then coat the ends, they metalize it to make a connection onto that. And that is the design of a surface mount resistor. It's very, very simple. And if they want to fine tune it, they can laser cut it just basically take little patches out of the carbon and that can fine tune the value. So the resistor is a very easy thing to make. Okay, let's take a look at a traditional diode then. A traditional glass sealed diode like a 1N4148 would have the little semiconductor junction inside two layers and they'd have the bond on and the wires coming out. And it's tiny. So when they make the equivalent in a surface mount little resin box, it's that same thing as inside there again leading out to the copper end pads for soda onto the circuit board. But when it comes to capacitors and their shrinking things, it all goes a bit pear-shaped. You see, a capacitor is basically a conductive layer, an insulator underneath that, and then under that again, another conductive layer. And the area of that conductive layer and the thickness of the insulator determines the capacitance. And a typical ceramic capacitor, like say for instance, if I had a, a power supply that was open, I don't think I have. Um, oh, this is messy. Look at the little blue capacitor in there. That's a sort of class Y style capacitor. And it's a traditional to me, that's a traditional single layer ceramic capacitor. It's a cylinder of the, uh, the, the ceramic material and they just put a metalized layer on one side and on the other side and then just bond some leads onto it. And that gives a fixed value of capacitance, but it's low. So to increase the value of capacitance, they have an arrangement like this, interleaved fingers. So they have 
one electrode is like that, the other electrode on the other side is like that, and then they put an insulating layer between all those layers. So these uh, multi-layer ceramic pastors are built up in layers, conductive to one side, ceramic, conductive to the other side, ceramic, and they end up with this tiny, tiny little cube. I'll just bring it in. Tiny little thing that has a really huge capacitance just because the layers are so thin that there's thousands of layers of those tiny little uh, conductive layers. The downside of that is that they compress it so tightly that thermal stress, if there's a crack at all occurs, and look at the top of this through a microscope quite hard because it's so tiny, I saw something that looked like a sort of fracture effect. A bit like when you've dropped your mobile phone and the screen's cracked. Uh, can I remind everybody if you've got a mobile phone to make sure you have a plastic cover over it to protect it from hard impacts, protects the screen from impacts. It just extends the life of it greatly. It's always worth having. But that is an increasing problem and Dave at EEV blog recently well, fairly recently, but it's not that recently, but he featured a power supply module and he had it on test. And it had one of these little ceramic multi-layer capacitors across the incoming power rails. And it went on fire because it failed and its resistance, the heat then caused it to fracture further and break down. And it started just burning between the conductive layers. And he had quite a little inferno in his hands there because it was just bridging between the low voltage DC supply, but it was shorting that out and acting like a resistor. And this is a common problem. I've, this isn't the first pass for infrared detector that I've come across that has had that same problem that it's been running batteries flat because the main input smoothing capacitor was uh, just displaying a resistive characteristic that had fractured, moisture had got in, and it basically it, it had uh, gone conductive. So there we go. It's interesting. It's a fairly common thing. It's something to look out for. It's the peril of miniaturization that they've just made things too small in the case of capacitors because they're effectively trying to get a very large area into a small space. It makes me wonder, are the newer, what is the future capacitors? Is it going to be the electrolytics with the supercapacitor type effect, the materials of an extra large surface area with a decisive barrier between them? Or are they just going to keep getting the layers thinner and thinner and thinner until they have more problems? This also means that soldering these manually is also always a bit of a grind because it puts high thermal stress across that. Uh, the ideal way to do these, it's probably one of the most sensitive components to it, is to put it on in a, a reflow oven and just gently ramp the heat up to the point that the whole thing is at uniform heat, no differential heat and expansion across it. And then the solder flows and then cool it down gently again. It's kind of made these a rather delicate little component. But fascinating, interesting way they fail. The only way I can think of fixing this is getting an equivalent one and actually soldering it in. But uh, there's not a lot of space inside that housing. It's going to have to be quite low. I was tempted to try and just solder another capacitor in, like even an electrolytic, but uh, it's actually fitted into that space is tricky. I may get a little stock of these capacitors, the ceramic ones, and uh, that will allow me to do repairs. I think I'd use the heat gun to repair them as opposed to the solder iron, though. Place the component on to just maybe some solder paste and then just gently bring the heat up to actually flow that to avoid that issue. But there we go. The thing is, well, the issue has been resolved. The rogue component has been found. It was just a small, insignificant component. Nothing really you might suspect things like the, the integrated circuit or the regulator or something like that. But in reality, it was just a fairly passive little capacitor. Fascinating stuff. It would be remiss of me to end the video without fixing this, wouldn't it? I have tested and found a little tiny electrolytic capacitor that will fit in there. The closest I had was 22 microfarad in that size. That will do. I'm going to remove the existing solder off the pads with some solder wick, which I have added a touch of flux to. Then I'm going to place the capacitor on keeping it as close to the circuit board as possible. I'm going to reflow the solder on that pad there, just a tiny bit, just to lock it in place. That has locked it in place. And then I'm going to get some decent solder here. I'm just going to aim that capacitor around so it's going to be as square to the case as possible so it actually fits in. 
I'm going to flow solder onto the other connection. Not being too pretty, but that's okay. Let that cool and then go back to the original connection and tough it up with a bit more solder. And that will be a fix if it fits in. The way to find that out is to zoom back out, and I'm zoomed in super close at the moment. Uh, take this off the bad dragon brick, which I was using as a support. Bad dragon for all your rectal fulfillment needs. And then this should hopefully slide in here. Let's try it for size. Is it going to fit? Is it going to fit? Is it going to fit? It fits. That is a viable fix then. Okay, I shall put batteries in this and prove that it's fixed. The light is back together. A quick test of quiescent current shows it's now dropped from 5 milliamps in its fault state to 40 microamps, which is a much more appropriate value for that. So now I can actually test it by turning this overhead light off. Uh, I've got the exposure off, so you'll see the light intensity yo-yoing up and down. And when I do that, it will detect my movement when I move, if the light level's low enough. It might not, because that ambient light over there is on. Hold on, I shall turn that off, and then move, and now it has lit. So there we go. That is fully working again. That's a good repair. So, sudden swamp of light again. That little capacitor over there, that tiny little capacitor, is going in the bin. It's caused all those problems. Good result.